Welcome to the message for Sunday, October 15th, 2023. I'm Pastor Teresa Heiser from the Penns Valley Charge of the United Methodist Church, and I want to begin with these centering words today. Unity in Christ is at the heart of the church's existence. If we are to follow Christ, we've got to find a way to follow him together. In our first passage, the Israelites in the wilderness become discontent as they wait for Moses to come down the mountain after his meetings with God. So this is Exodus 32, verses 1 to 14 in the New American Standard Bible, which is copyright 1995. This is a word-for-word translation of the original language. And this particular passage in the New American Standard Bible is titled, The Golden Calf. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They've made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Our second reading is a letter from Paul to the church in Philippi. Uh, He's addressing some division that's brewing over two women teachers in the congregation. Now, the whole thing hinges and really leads to this last part when Paul encourages the church to shift their focus away from what divides and destroys, saying, what did she say? Well, what did she say to what did Christ say? What has God done so that they care more about unity in Christ, more about each other than self, and become truly kingdom focused. So hear these words from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge you, Adia, and I urge Sintik, to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. In our final reading, Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14, Jesus tells the final of the three parables in the temple in response to a question that the chief priests and elders ask. Jesus responded by telling still more stories. God's kingdom, he said, is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out servants to call in all the invited guests, and they wouldn't come. He sent out another round of servants, instructing them to tell the guests, look, everything is on the table. The prime rib is ready for carving. Come to the feast. They only shrugged their shoulders and went off. One to weed his garden, another to work in his shop. The rest, with nothing better to do, beat up on the messengers and then killed them. The king was outraged and sent his soldiers to destroy those thugs and level their city. Then he told his servants, we have a wedding banquet all prepared, but no guests. The ones I invited weren't up to it. Go out into the busiest intersections in town and invite anyone you find to the banquet. The servants went out on the streets and rounded up everyone they laid eyes on, good and bad, Regardless, and so the banquet was on, every place filled. When the king entered and looked over the scene, he spotted a man who wasn't properly dressed. He said to him, friend, how dare you come in here looking like that? The man was speechless. Then the king told his servants, get him out of here fast. Tie him up and ship him to hell and make sure he doesn't get back in. That's what I mean when I say, many get invited, only a few make it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In our Give and Answer series, today we're going to focus on another question. And the question we're looking at today is, I go to church, so I'll get into heaven, right? The first reading from Exodus finds Moses on the mountain with God receiving the basics, the Ten Commandments, those basics that are needed to live in community together. What does God expect of his chosen people? But while he's gone, the Israelites become impatient yet again, and they grumble and they mumble. This time, though, what they want is in response to their presupposition that Moses isn't coming back. And perhaps they feel like Moses is their link to God, and so they fear they don't have one, and so they need a God. They need something else to uh, pray to and worship. And so Aaron offers to make something out of their stuff. So stuff they give him, he will fashion into a God that they will then give the credit for getting out of Egypt and out of slavery and where they are now. So he's going to make something now that they're going to give credit for what happened before instead of God. It just makes no sense. <laughs> it really makes no sense. What they really want yet again is their own way. They want their own way. They want to assign credit to something they create and thank it for what God has done. They think it's going to make them happy, but if you really look at it, with an objective eye and an objective mind, what it makes them is ungrateful, impatient, immature, but most importantly, 
disobedient to God, the God that brought them out of slavery in Egypt, in fact, and prepared them for this land promised to them long ago through the obedience of Abraham and others. And God is frustrated. And we've seen Moses frustrated by the Israelites on several occasions. And it was God who was saying, okay, I've got this. I've got this. But now God is frustrated. And God is the one talking about, you know, how ungrateful these people are. How God has over and over again supplied. He's been trying to help them to understand. I am the God of your father, Abraham. I am here. I am going to provide what you need. Talk to me. Follow these commands. And so very disappointed, he's talking with Moses. And it was God that supplied the need. You know, it's like, how can they miss this? It was God who supplied the need. Now, M Moses is experiencing this role reversal, right? Because before he would be going to God and saying, what am I going to do with these people? They're complaining about this. They want food. They want water. They're complaining help. And then God would, of course, come through. It was God that supplied the need over and over again. And now God is frustrated and Moses must maintain and restore composure. And personally, I don't really believe for a moment that God needed Moses to calm God. I think God needed Moses to understand something much bigger. And that is the possibilities that exist for God when God is angry. Because God has a lot more possibilities. God can do a lot more things than I can do, than Moses can do, than the, the Israelites can do. And then really appreciate, because of that understanding, then be able to really appreciate the steadfast love of God to care for his people, especially when they understand that they don't deserve it. You know, that's the, the goodness of God is something that I do fully recognize. I don't deserve the goodness of God, but boy, do I appreciate the goodness of God. Now, in the, in the uh, second reading, Paul reminds the church in Philippi about their ancestors all the way back to Exodus, how they disputed and divided and they picked sides when they should have been rejoicing and grateful. So they chose incorrectly then. They were kind of starting to do the same thing. And so rather than fixating on the debates between these two women in the church, these two female leaders and teachers, Paul offers a list of qualities of thoughts worth having and meditating on that. And that, of course, reveals the kind of thoughts not worth having and meditating on. So, so you have the thoughts that are good versus the things that, well, if they don't match those lists, if it's the opposite of those things in that list, then those are things you should not be meditating on. In the final reading, Jesus challenges everyone hearing this parable. It's the last of the three parables that he offers. And the parables kind of become progressively... Um, I don't want to say worse, but they become progressively more impactful and eternally impactful. So they have escalated in a way. Matthew's parable is quite different from what you read in Luke 14 in that parable is the, the one that is set there is set at, a, at the house of a Pharisee that invited Jesus to dinner, emphasizing the inclusion of the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And in Matthew's parable, the host is the king. And not just any king, the king, who invites guests to a wedding banquet. And who would you invite to a banquet? You would invite those who were set apart, those who were the closest, uh, the ones that you were putting into a place of honor. But imagine if those chosen ones, they, they not just don't show up, they just refuse the invitation. I mean, it's, it's worse than not showing up, refusing the invitation. So maybe they didn't understand the assignment. So the king sends out a second round of uh, messengers to bring those invitations again, hearkening back to God and Moses on the mountain. The king responds, sending troops to destroy those murderers and uh, burn their city. Now, righteous judgment has come and God can do that. You know, God has, like I said, more, so many options so many more options than, than you or I have. And when the third and final invitation goes out to all who are not on that first guest list, good or bad invitations are accepted and the king gets the party started. Now I shared each week that if we take parables too literally, we miss the point because they're spiritual stories. They're not literal stories. 
So you want to get the spiritual point. We can get lost in the sauce and just miss it if we take it too literally. The wedding clothes are very important to the story because wedding clothes or the wedding garment in the parable has been interpreted literally instead of spiritually, which has caused confusion and has caused all kinds of things to take place in the church that just were, were completely just off base. So if we go to the conclusion of the parable, for many are called, but few are chosen, we can glean that the many called are those who were invited yet refused the invitation, and that those who chose the, to accept the invitation chose how they came in, meaning how they were dressed, which is very important because that serves to be an outward expression of their inward intention when accepting the invitation. So why does Jesus use wedding clothes as the reason the guest is thrown out of the party. Why is that? Because this is very important because it's been misinterpreted and used to come up with all different kinds of rules that really don't have any bearing on the story. So here it is in context. In ancient times, a guest at a rich family's wedding, royalty certainly would fall into that category, they would be required to wear the designated wedding clothes provided by the host. You see, the host... Uh, would provide these clothes because the clothes were considered part of the decoration or part of the theme of the wedding. So you see the clothes themselves were part of the decor, so to speak. To refuse to wear them would be a serious insult to the host. So this was not just a matter of they weren't dressed nicely, they weren't dressed up. It was they refused to wear the wedding clothes provided to them by the king, and especially a royal host. My word, in, in many parts of the Middle East and Asia, that tradition is still practiced. Wedding clothes are still sent out. They are still part of the tradition. And if you see wedding videos and receptions happening in those locations for, for prominent families, you will see that many are dressed in the similar theme. There's no more prominent a family than the family of God. So clothing is a part of the wedding itself. We now understand that. But Jesus was explaining that the only way to the kingdom of God is by wearing what the king has provided. To be clothed in Christ. So see where I'm saying? If you take it too literally, you miss the spiritual point. The good and the bad people had to set aside their good or bad clothing and be clothed in Christ. And then... In doing this, they are submitting themselves to Christ. Now, to think about the old ways of baptism. Now, if you look, uh, if you've ever seen old footage or old photos, you see that everyone is, they're not in their usual street clothes. They're not in their usual church clothes. They're usually wearing a white robe or some outfit of white. And it's really because that's part of the day. They're wearing their baptism clothes. They're coming to God on God's terms and not on their own. It's kind of the, the idea and the theme. So we don't know if the guest who was kicked out was among the good or among the bad. We don't know how he was dressed. We just know that he was not wearing the wedding clothes. So it could have been that he was wealthy and decided his best outfit was actually better than the wedding clothes and, and maybe even better than what the king had supplied. Could have been that he was a very poor criminal who could not for the life of him understand why in the world he would be invited to this thing in the first place. And obviously the king has no standards. And so he's just going to wear what he's comfortable in and his sweatpants and, and whatever and enjoy the free food and the music. We really don't know how they're dressed. We don't know if they're good or bad. We simply know that they are not wearing Christ. Everyone is invited to the kingdom of God. There's no criteria for receiving an invitation, but it doesn't mean there's no criteria for participating in the wedding banquet. We are invited to be part of the congregation of Christ, not by our own standards, okay, of what that might look like, to have ever-changing, you know, standards of the community of Christ is chaos, and God provides order. God brings order out of chaos. So we're given the instructions how to follow Christ in the fullness of scripture with the implicit expectation 
that we will, you know, that we will obey God's will, not our own. God's will, not my will be done. As, as unworthy as I might think of myself on occasion, God is always worthy of my obedience. And in that spirit, I was led to a litany of peace to close the message today, given all that's going on in the state of Israel and uh, with the Palestinian people as well. I would like for you to, if you would be so willing, to join me in that litany. It is a responsive litany. I'm going to share it on the screen. God, so many people are in pain. Teach us the way to peace. When people around us don't agree and think differently, teach us to listen and try to understand. When we see people getting hurt, teach us to speak up. When we see people treated poorly because of their skin color or language or religious belief, teach us to be an example of love and acceptance. When we see war and conflict, teach us how to make a difference and seek peace. When we see pain, teach us to bring healing. When we feel confused and afraid, Remind us to talk to our friends, our family, and to you. In our lives, our neighborhoods, and the world, teach us to pray and teach us the way of peace. I want to thank you for spending some time with me today. I hope the message spoke to you. I hope that you're understanding the parable a little bit better with the context of the uh, wedding clothes and I invite you to come back next week because the question we're going to answer is what belongs to God? That's the next question next week. Until then, the invitation to the kingdom of God is free to all, but it's not a free for all. So keep that in mind until next time. Build a fire under us and within us, Lord. Enable us to joyfully go into your world to serve your people and in doing so, serve you also. Go in peace, dear friends, and know that God goes with you. Amen. You're going to find a lot of things are coming up at the churches, so you can check out the schedule of, of events that are coming up. We've got the all, all kinds of things online right now. We've got 30 days of prayer that's going on. You can read about that. Uh, we still have a couple more weeks of our study, The Secret Power of Kindness, and it's never too late to join. So you have details about that and so much more at pensvalleyparish.info. Till next time I see you, have a wonderful and very blessed week.